Dougie, welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me, man. Thanks for having me. And it's Dougie, 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 Dougie. Dougie. <laughs> I think, yeah, obviously I told you we said about this with my team. They were like convinced it was Dougie, but I was like, no, it's Dougie. That's you, sh- you should really own that. I know. I need to make a decision on it, right? I think it's just speaking to people in England or not in Scotland, it's always Dougie. It's like, <laughs> they, they understand that easier than Dougie. Um, but I appreciate it. So we wanted to make some time to have a chat yep. about a few things. We've done quite a bit of work together this year with the podcast and, and Sourcewell. So definitely want to talk about that. We've done three live podcast events this year, which have been super fun. And Thanks then we've you. also worked together on the BD Playbook series, which went down really well. Absolutely. And I think we wanted to also just talk a bit about definitely like your journey. I think you've been on such a great journey, considering I was saying we sat sure. down in 2019. Uh, when I worked for Hoxo, so that was insane. That was in a little, East London, a little room up a up a set of stairs, yeah, right at the back. Like. Yeah. So we sat down when you was at Odro in 2019, and then now you've been on this journey with Source often in the last two years. So definitely want to just touch on that because I think there's definitely things there that people can learn from, and then also, like, yeah, really interested to dig into, like, your perspective sitting in the seat that you're in on like how. Sourcewell has been helping a lot of the companies and customers that you've been partnering with this year because I, I do really feel like you guys have been at the forefront of driving just better business development habits and, and just better like practices across the industry. Um, and then I think we want to talk a bit about the future and yeah. some of the, the really cool features that you guys have rolled out this year. So how, how have you found the events this year? Honestly, man, I think the events have been sick. Like mm-hmm. if I look back at... Um, The first one of the year was in Manchester, right? We Mm -hmm. did Manchester first, and I think that was probably my favourite event of Mm. of the year. Just having everybody together in one room. um, Everyone was just so, like the panellists as well. So I think you had Alex, Kyle, and Amber, Amber, and they were just so open about, Mm. you know, the challenges, because that was like, what, April, May time? Yeah. So we were in the, the midst of... Market was really starting to slow down. Mm. BD was really the focus. People were starting to change their approach, and I think all three of them delivered like really actionable insights in terms of stuff that could be done to to improve. And don't get me wrong, the London and Bristol events were amazing as well. Mm. But I think like the real value from the events has been people actually sharing tactical advice and not just big massive thoughts and ideas that sound great but don't actually translate to to, to yeah. There's some results. really some really good tangibles from that episode. I think what what I remember from stuff like that is just like always Manchester it doesn't quite go to plan yeah Northerners <laughs> alcohol it's always a bit of a mess absolutely it wasn't anything too crazy but I just all I remember stuff like that definitely like yeah they did such a good job of communicating like the things that are working for them the things that they're doing but I just remember getting down into the room where we did the podcast and then people were like just still trying to get a drink and then everyone was waiting yeah was, and then yeah. do you remember the mic as well oh, the mic that, so mic. you had to do that was a bit of a yeah that was there. so like, they're the sort of things that i remember from those types of things <laughs> totally. but that's the thing though you must be under pressure right to deliver yeah like you feel the pressure of delivering a really great event and then mm. these little things are starting to like that are like outside of the plan so your head's almost on that versus the versus yeah, the stuff yeah. that's but going no, i agree on. that that was that was great i think it's something that i shared with you but i do think if you think of those three uh, people, Alex is very much involved in the business that recruits in the tech uh, SaaS space. Yeah, Kyle, that's his space as well. And then because I've got to know Amber, I know that she consumes a lot of content from B two B SaaS, uh, go to market uh, content. And I've definitely found like when we think about you know what you guys are doing, multi channel approach, yeah. that's like just expected or been so normalized for a long time from my understanding in those types of spaces. Absolutely. So I think I shared a view that people that tend to operate in that space oftentimes are sort of probably quite a few steps ahead of, you know, a bunch of other people in the industry because they're 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 placing or dealing with people that are already approaching sales the way that they're approaching it, right? Yeah, so they obviously have exposure because naturally through the question that they mm. do on like candid interviews or client meetings, like they're learning about these um, skills and techniques and processes, like you said, because ultimately they're placing people into those jobs. I like, don't get me wrong, I, I definitely still think there is nuance to recruitment that is not applicable always within the sales space, right? Mm. But I do think that if we're honest, a lot of what we do as recruiters is sales. Mm. You know, we've got a kind of B2B sales process, which is, you know, the selling to the client, if that makes sense. And mm-hmm. then we've got a kind of B2C sales process, which is like the, the sale with the, the candidate um, or, you know, potentially selling them on an opportunity. Um, 
so I think what a lot of those people have done is they've identified like the transferable processes and um, mm. approaches and they've been able to then apply that to to the recruitment space. But I do think you you need to be really aware of, like you said, those new, or like we said there, those nuances and those changes, because if you just wholesale took everything that was happening in a yeah. SaaS and applied it to recruitment, you'd yeah probably end up with a pretty ineffective business model and, and, and not a lot of placements at the yeah, end of it. Yeah, for sure. But like you've been, as I was saying, like you've been... I think you've been on such an interesting journey. So like five years of Audro, where you literally was like one of the earlier employees, right? Yeah, absolutely. Working with with Ryan. And then by the time you left, you were CRO of that business. But you yeah. had also got exposed to like customer success, sales, other things, I'm sure. Yeah. And then for the last two years, you've been in the seat of CRO for Salsa, right? Like what, I'm just curious, because you've been serving this rec tech market for yep. quite a while, right? Nearly, nearly a decade. So how how much sounds wild when you see it? Yeah. Like that. So like how how much have you seen it change? Like if you think of like the landscape now uh, and the types of products available for growing recruitment companies, like how do you see it from like your seat? Because you've you would have come up against a lot of companies when you worked at Audro. Yep. You would have been aware of the different partners. Likewise, now Sourcewell. Yeah, absolutely. the The market has changed. A decade sounds wild, um, but the market has changed. The market's changed a lot, particularly from like the technology that's available to people. Mm. I remember back in twenty sixteen when I first joined Audro, and and you know I was working with Ryan, and we were trying to kind of get the message out there and stuff. You know, this this concept of even meeting people online was super alien. Yeah. Never mind recording that interaction. <laughs> right? It's like this concept that you would even record that you would even meet people online and then record it. Whereas I can't remember the last time I was on an online meeting where it wasn't automatically recorded, whether that's internally or externally, predominantly externally. And, um, you know, I think, you know, back then that was almost quite, I wouldn't say revolutionary, but definitely a very new idea and a new concept. Yeah. I think a lot of the tech that existed back kind of 2016, 2017, well, a lot of it was still to do with was coming more so from like the um, like the in-house side of things. So a lot of like uh, job board technology, mm. search and match, you know, a lot of that kind of candidate work. Whereas what I see a lot more now in the market is tools that focus also on the business development side of things, um, but a big focus on recruiter efficiency and automation mm. as well. So, uh, but I think like automation, AI efficiency or an approach to a more efficient process is something that's become more of a focus for recruitment businesses mm. naturally over time. Um, I don't necessarily think that back in 2016, many people were thinking the, art, the way they are now, which is how can we do more with less, which yeah. I think is probably the main focus for most most businesses. Do you think, I was speaking to someone about this today, yep. do you think recruiters are more efficient now with all these tools available compared to when they didn't have all these tools available? Because the person I was speaking to was pretty convinced that they're not. Do you know, man, <laughs> like it's, it's going to be weird for someone in my seat to say this. Um, I think like right now, as it stands right now, um, probably not. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's because of the volume of tools. So we've gone from, if you think of this like small circle of, mm -hmm. of, um, of like additional products on top of your CRM that you could purchase to now there are like multiple products within multiple segments. Um, you know, available that, that didn't even exist as like a product category before. And very few platforms and products are doing what other platforms and products are doing as well. So mm -hmm. for example, if I wanted to achieve this end goal of having everything in my process automated and this the, an analytics set up and whatever it might be, I'd have my CRM and then maybe five, six, seven different, uh, you know, pieces of technology bundled onto that. There's no way that anyone can effectively use, <laughs> you know, five, six different pieces of technology on a day-to-day -day, uh, in, their, in their role. I think probably what we see more so is there'll be recruiters who gravitate more so towards the products that do make them more efficient, mm. but then they cap out on that. So, um, no, I don't think recruiters are more efficient right now. I think they yeah. can be, but I think it's going to take something or somebody to kind of almost um, pull all of those platforms together into one place that allows people to execute that rather than having them working across five, six, seven one different places. Yeah. So what... What excited you about Sourcewell then when you started to, because I'm sure that you would have had the other offers, opportunities. Yeah, it was know. really interesting. So uh, for me, there was three main things. Um, the first one was the, the team. Um, and this isn't, uh, you know, I'm not comparing this to what I had at Audro. This was more so just looking at this from like a, like through a very different lens in mm. terms of like, what am I going to do next? Um, so, you know, Tim and Harry are both, you know, incredibly intelligent people. Um, both don't come from a recruitment background, so I found that really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but both very, very well educated and, and, and have backgrounds in different arenas. 
and they'd built this kind of initial team who um really driven, really motivated, um, and really you know, really believed in what they were doing. So that really stood out to me. Second thing was the product. Um and the product was the part that captured my attention because I knew mm. of Sourcewell and I'd spoken to Ben, who's a VP of or, or VP of sales now, um, and Tim a number of times over probably a twelve month period before mm. I before I joined um, Sourcewell. And the product always stood out to me in terms of the way it was just taking something that was such an obvious problem mm. and making it so much more simple for everyone. Like you know, at its core, automating follow ups. You know, just that's <laughs> it. Like you know, if I can just automate the follow ups that I need to send, then you know, never mind all the other bells and whistles. That in itself mm. was super valuable. Um, and then the third thing was their passion for the US market. So I was really keen to, you know, looking at what I wanted to do next is like take things more internationally. We'd done a lot of work at Audro in um, in the UK. Um, and in like places like Asia and some work in the US, but we'd never really had boots in the ground. Um, mm. So for me, I wanted the ability to kind of do more in the US market. And I mean, so far so good. It's not it's not been without its challenges, but we're definitely making headway, uh, headway there. And then like I always ask you this, this right, but like how, how have you managed juggling all this with a young family, mate? <laughs> like you're saying, you fly, flew down this morning. Yeah. You know, um, I always, all, when I think of, people uh it's funny when i think of scottish people in recruitment i think of you <laughs> nick who else do i think of uh, the guy that works at page now i can't remember his name cammy cammy yeah and like you know but i, f I feel like did you work at audrey or not yeah cammy worked for us at audrey yeah, yeah so yeah. like and i think how are these guys just getting on the plane every day on the easy jet or oh. ryanair or whatever coming down Honestly, there's a thing called the EasyJet Plus card, right? And it's uh, you've got to get an EasyJet Plus card. <laughs> Basically, it gives you fast track security. It gives you uh, you get on the plane first, and you get extra legroom. And right. it's like it's like 150 quid a year or whatever. Right. But it's just it's it's, a, it's an absolute godsend. Um, but like honestly, like from a family perspective, um, I'm really lucky. Like my, my wife's fantastic. You mm. know, she's great. Um, it is hard though. Like I wouldn't say. Mm. I wouldn't say it's easy to just always be like, you know, away from the kids. My daughter, she's eight now. My son, he's 18 months old. I mean, just the age gap alone between those two is an intense, an intense <laughs> thing. Um, and it's great. You know, I absolutely love spending time with them. Um, but I, I think that doing business face to face is mm. both internally and externally just gives you a kind of an advantage over so many other people in the market and so many other people in the industry. So I, I would never be able to give that up. You know, ultimately, it's my choice to work with an organization that is headquartered in London that mm. has operations in the US. And when I was at Audro, you know, whilst it was headquartered in Glasgow, predominantly served businesses that were based in London. And, you know, that's part and parcel of the job. And I got all of the upsides of that as well, right? I got all of the benefits of, of what that brings. So yeah, sometimes you've got to make some sense. No, I just always respect it. So, Thanks, so talk to me about, let's like reflect a bit on 2023. Cause yep. I think one of the, the core overarching themes of all the conversations I've had this year, obviously I'm speaking to companies about how they can get more out of their people, yep. what skill gaps do they have, and and the most common one has all, like throughout this entire year has been, last year was very job heavy, and I think a lot of people went into this year not equipped with the right skills to thrive in what's been you know a lot more of a challenging market compared to what people have been used to. I think a lot of people that have been in the industry for a long time would just describe it as a, a competitive, good quality market where you have to work hard and uh, you can absolutely still thrive in a market like it is today. But I think a lot of people didn't have those client acquisition skills, which I think re a lot of people struggled with. And obviously that that's why I really gravitated towards Sourceware and why I think, like you said, it's such an obvious problem. Because yeah. when I think about when I worked in recruitment and I think about how I used to do business development, it it was every Tuesday and Thursday, ten till twelve. I knew that it was the BD time. Obviously, you've got to be doing BD out of that as well, but we'll be doing it. <laughs> we'll be doing it collectively, and I would be just chasing uh, live vacancies. I would yeah. be looking at my calendar and seeing who did I call last week. And it was just like so manual and so reliant on my own brain to remember like what I need to be doing. There's no strategy. So I know you guys do so much more than this, but like that's why I think in terms of like the, the prob one of the problems that you solve for a, lot, for a lot of your companies, I just feel like you guys are front and center of like what people have had to do or how they've had to adapt this year. So talk, talk to me a bit about like what have been from your perspective, some of the like one, two biggest problems that 
you being partnering customers to to solve yeah, for them. Absolutely. I think just before we go into that, it's worth noting that actually some of the, the biggest success and the biggest traction that Sourcewheel had gotten um you know, prior to me joining, was actually in the uh, was actually in candidate sourcing. Really? So yeah. So like, what happened? Obviously, the because this concept of like automating follow ups applies not just to clients; it applies to candidates mm. as well. So in that market where it was really job heavy and everyone was trying their best to engage with candidates, you know, the best way to do that was to not be the guy or girl that gave up after the first approach. Right? Yeah. You know, they were getting a lot of emails, but if you were the person that was emailing them two or three times and then dropping a phone call in and then maybe messaging them on LinkedIn, you stood more of a chance of mm. having that having that conversation. Um. And what's happened is by working, you know, with the customers that we've had, we've been able to kind of support them from that transition from the candidate sourcing, you know, a lot of their work being spent on candidate sourcing, more so towards that business development model mm. as well. Um, I think like for me, the main part is like that that automation and organization piece. So mm. being able to um, organize everything that a recruiter is doing from a BD and headhunting perspective into one place. So their calls, their emails, mm. their LinkedIn messages, um, automating some of that for them, but still maintaining a strong element of personalization. Um, but then just making sure that they know how to reach out to and when. And when you've got a bunch of people who are learning how to probably even do BD for like the first time, mm not having to remember that part of the job and actually mm. just focusing on what they have to say when they have the conversation or when they're writing that email just makes life a whole lot easier for them as well. And what have you found when you've had your conversations with the sales team and these things, like what is the most common way you found that people do do that before source? I forget what I mean. Like, are you? is it still very much like people using their email calendars, they're setting themselves reminders, like how are people typically doing it? It's really varied. Um, there are people who have like, I mean, I still use a day plan if that makes sense, yeah. but not for that type of activity. I sit down and I, you know, I say mm. what well, this is, the meetings I want to have today, etc. cetera. Um, but there's a lot of people who still track down and say, here's the callbacks that I'm going to do tomorrow morning and they'll write that down in their mm. notepad. Um, email calendars, I think some CRM systems have like a reminder system. So mm -hmm. like, you know, set a reminder to reach out to this person on this date or whatever. Um, but none of that is obviously linked into what happens before it. So if you'd responded to me or whatever it might be, obviously don't want that reminder to then come through because it's no longer relevant. Um, and then there's some people who use spreadsheets. So they'll actually pull out, and these are the people who are actually closest, I think, to doing what Sourcewheel achieves from a technology perspective, mm. but manually, where they'll pull out on a spreadsheet along the top, like step one to step eight and what each of them are. And then mm. every time they do it, they'll put like a little cross or they'll <laughs> color the box or whatever and go through it. So obviously not the most efficient way, but like- I'd, They're still, yeah. I think what, why I think that's great, because I think this is part of the problem that you guys are trying to help solve is a lot of people don't have a system yeah. towards their business development or the, the, the headhunting. They just know I'm going to keep trying until I maybe get a rejection or I get a no. Do you know what I mean? There's no, like, I, I can't put my BD plan into, like, a system. I think that's also where I think sometimes uh, people really need to think about that as well. Yeah, and I think that's, like, you're talking about the biggest problems. That's mm. that's the second problem. If I think of it, like, from, like, a management or leadership level, whether you've got people who are experienced at business development or are doing it for the first time or, or anybody on that spectrum, it's really hard to actually get an insight in terms of, like, what's working. Mm. You know, um, you know, is our messaging resonating? Are, are we making enough calls? Um, are the calls that we're making actually leading to results? Mm. Um, is the way that we approach candidates in this space different to the way we approach candidates in that, that space? Because ultimately, it's you know it's hard to see a kind of a, a single view of that data, and you're always relying on the recruiter manually logging that information in the CRM to mm. even get you anywhere close to that in the first place. So, being able to give that data and insight automatically to the management team, and also then automatically track it into the CRM for the recruiters means that they save time, the recruitment mm. side, but the management team gets the data that they need and, and everybody wins. Mm. And I think that's the beauty of it. Yeah, that's that's what I really that's what I also gravitated towards as well because, like, if I was to log into my source well now then you're in the sales team like she she's got like an unreal open rate yep. and then when i've been doing some of my campaigns recently i've been getting nowhere near what she's got and i'm like <laughs> but i can Just see what yeah exactly <laughs> but i can like i can see the emails that she's done what's working yep. so that's why i also liked as well because if i think back when i was in recruitment like everyone is sort of almost working in their own silos yeah, yeah. so if like someone's got an unbelievable email response rate and I could, there could be a good chance I have no idea what they're putting in that. 
and he might not even want to share it with you. Yeah, right? exactly. I remember. I remember. I think I told you this story, but um, my one of my first ever recruitment jobs, there was a guy who was great at selling retainers. Like mm. we would go into the month, and this guy had already done his, his his target or quota for the month. Sometimes he would come into a quarter, and he'd mm. already done it. It was wild, right? It was unbelievably good. I mean, he works in the Cayman Islands now, like doing like private equity recruitment <laughs> and stuff. I mean, he's, he's amazing, right? It's really really good. Um, but I remember asking him. I was like, oh, like. Like teach me, you know, how do you do that? I was like nineteen or something, and he was like, "I just make it happen." And I was like, "That's just <laughs> so not helpful." Like, you know how, and and you know, and he still to this day has never taught me how he how he did it. But I think, um, you know, as especially when people are working remotely and working mm. from home, like that was a conversation I could have with him in that office, and if he'd been more inclined to do so, he could have given me some guidance or advice. Mm. Um, but you're right, like you just don't always have that that ability to have that conversation. And even if you do, there's no there's no mm. guarantee that you would. That, that well, you if would you think about time. ramping up the performance of my people more quickly, rather than Dougie joining my business, trying to have to figure out for however long period like what's working, what isn't, yeah. I can just equip you with some of the best outreach messages that are working right now for the team. Totally. Do you know what I mean? It's just simple stuff like that. What um what I was gonna uh, say was we're talking about being efficient like how how important is it like to really maximize partnering with you guys is it going to be a real ball like if like like how so basically if i have a crm mm -hmm. am i really going to get the most out of source oil if source oil works with that crm do you know what i mean because we're thinking about being efficient because like yeah. how how effective are you guys going to be if i've got a crm but then i have to you know log into do you, do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I'm just sharing good. that because I think that's Im important to get people's... Yeah, it's a great question. So we integrate with over 60 different systems. Um, mm. So, you know, if you think of like the most common, you know, recruitment CRM systems, like we probably already integrate with them. Um, so uh, ultimately the whole point of, of Sourcewheel, the way that we see Sourcewheel and the future for the business and for the, for the, the platform is we see Sourcewheel as your system of work. Mm. You see your CRM or your ATS system as your system of record. And essentially, if you're having to execute any of your business development or candidate sourcing activity, that's all executed from a single place inside SourceWheel. Right. And we'll automatically log all of that all information, the information for it into the system of records. So you don't have to like get to Friday afternoon and be like tapping Do away and saying yeah. I did these calls that or that sense. calls. It's all it's all just going through. Oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. So talk to me about what have been some of your you can either talk from like personal, like what you think have been great or just the stuff that you know that you hear for customer success, but I've written down some of the features that we've really enjoyed using this year, but what have been some of the, the best features you think that people have really enjoyed using this year, um, using this year at Sourcewell? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's probably three three that spring to mind. Um, I think the first one, which was really a bit of a game changer around May time, um, end of June, again, or sorry, end of May was um, content coach. So yeah. again, everyone's trying to do business development, everyone's out there, there's more email content, LinkedIn messaging, et cetera, than ever before. So what we did was we took um, data from over 21.8 million pieces of outreach that had mm. gone out through the platform. We looked for trends and patterns of things that were working best. Um, and we then created um, almost like an algorithm and system in the background that when you're now writing a message inside Sourcewheel or an email or whatever it might be, we score it against that framework and then mm. provide insights directly to the user. So we, we, we can let you know if there's particular spam phrases that you're using or if the subject line is too long, too short, um, or uh, you know if there's certain phrases or techniques or calls to action that you should maybe consider using as well. Um, and that's been that's been massive in terms of the improvement that we've seen from what the average kind of content coach score was pre-launch to like post-launch and the oh, improvement nice. that we've seen over that time. Yeah, because that was the one I put down, the email, I put it as email score. Yeah. But it's, what's it called? Content coach. Content coach. Oh, okay, there we go. So. Made do better marketing on the name yeah, of it. Content but... coach. No, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that is so helpful. Yeah. Because, you know how it is, there's so much information out there now as well. Yeah. But I think, you know, you're not, I know I always say this to people that do, uh, are considering source while using it, like a big part of it is also, you know, knowing how to write an effective message. Absolutely. <laughs> Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, because you could be doing, like, let's be honest, right? we, we promote obviously multiple steps, multiple mm. channels, but ultimately if the message isn't great, then you're not going to get results. Yeah. Like you can send it a hundred times, but it's just not going to, you're not going to But if you can it. help me understand where I can improve and that that's the same, like I've, I've used uh, Grammarly for like, oh, yeah, uh, for so long. And I think if I think about when I first started using Grammarly to now, like my writing has become so much more concise and you just get better. So the idea would be hopefully when you, you know, write out these initial messages, 
your your baseline is a much higher score, which means there's a more likelihood you're getting response, open rates, these things. That's it. I think um, just on Grammarly, my I'm convinced that my spelling, grammar, and punctuation is worse than it's ever been because oh, really? Grammarly like just corrects it all for me, and I'm not even aware Thinking of it anymore. It, yeah. So I just like type things out, and I don't even know if they're correct. But like I'm so I'm so grateful for it because mm. it's not something that I've ever you know had a massive kind of you know f- uh, focus on. So mm. actually having that there automatically correcting that is is absolutely beautiful. So. What what else jumps out? So I've got on here. uh, I'll be honest. I haven't proper played around with the uh, Well GPT. I'll be honest. So the ones I put down were insights that that we really enjoyed that because obviously, you know, when you're looking at people that you're sending messages to, you're looking for any you know points that you can use for personalization, and that made that so much easier being able to sort of see that in one window. Absolutely, and I think we talk about the power of personalization because I think like you, we're, we've used the words automated and mm. outreach and sequences, and people you know might have this view where you just sit and blast out four or five emails, you press a button. And everyone just gets the same content, but obviously that's not the power of source wheel, right? Like the power of source wheel is having that kind of facility, but with the personalization um, added in. And like you said, insights is essentially this feature whereby if I'm on your LinkedIn profile, for example, it gives me information such as like an overview of your company. So when it was founded, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, revenue, employee mm-hmm. headcount, um, it gives me a list of com- competitors potentially. So if we're thinking of, um, an organization targeting a tech company, mm. they can start to see, okay, well, if this is a company that I want to try and win from, then I might want to try and approach these organizations totally. as well. Um, and then obviously you get things like news, any job postings that they've got on, mm. which is obviously valuable, and then funding as, as well. Yeah, so like we found that really uh, helpful. But you are you are right. Like, I think for most of our campaigns, the first thing that we have in there is a custom variable, which we have to fill out. Yeah. But then we've sort of scripted and templated and played around with then like the core message. But yeah, if you're just spending time on the personalization element and hopefully giving yourself a better chance of it being opened and responded to, but then the the other elements are automated, then that's... I think, the beauty, awesome, yeah. I think the beauty of it as well is like it makes the calls warmer. So, you know, knowing that that first email is going out with that personalization, maybe there's a second email that goes out as like an automated follow up. But then the third step is, you know, hey, Hashem, you've got, you know, 14 phone calls to make today. Click here to log in and make them. Mm. Um, and then, you know, you can see the previous content that's gone out. You've got that information. I'm going to call you up. I can reference the content mm. that I've already sent to you as well. Totally. Anything else jump out to you? I put, how long have you had the live feed on there? Uh, it's not live yet. Oh, it's not, it's, oh, not, okay, it's on beta. So. <laughs> that, that, that got me excited because yeah. it's going to be sick. We've been playing around with it internally. Like, again, you know. Because that, that's like, I think of HubSpot on that, like yeah. the HubSpot extension, because it's really helpful to see when someone opens an email or like what's going on. And then you can be a bit more reactive sometimes. You can get on it straight away. And again, we're talking about like BD in 2024. We'll maybe come on to this later. Mm. Um, you know, getting in touch with people when the intent's at the highest is, is obviously the yeah, ultimate. Yeah, time is a big element. Absolutely. We used to do that at Audro a lot where. You know, when we would send people like video messages and we would get notifications when it was watched, then we would, you know, make a point of calling people um, instantly and they would be like, That's so weird, I'm watching your video and I'm like, I know, like that's yeah. part of the product and yeah. it'd be a great way to a great way to so see. anything else that you've enjoyed or you know that people have enjoyed? Uh, there's been there's been lots, man. I think um I think we, we, we do a ton of upgrades and um, and updates to the integrations that we work with that just right, that aren't like super sexy for the front end, but you know, are always there to support the way because everybody someone might have a certain CRM but actually every recruiter tends to use their CRM in a slightly different way. Mm. So we do a lot of custom work that, that helps right, people fair. feed information in the background. What are, we say, what are we saying about going into next year then? So like, I just put here like features we're, we're excited about. What are yeah. things that are front of mind, top of mind that, you know, people are probably going to be excited about? Yeah, I think, um, try not to commit massively to, to major roadmap updates, but <laughs> um, I touched on it a little bit earlier. We very much get this vision of system of work, right? Mm-hmm. So we see Sourcewheel as being, you know, our, our mission is very much to look at the entire end-to-end recruitment process and look for where friction exists mm-hmm. and then work to remove that friction, which is what we've done with our core product on the business development and headhunting side um, or candidate sourcing side. So we're looking at a couple of things going into the new year um, in terms of, you know, when you're making calls through the platform, how can we make that easier for you? How mm. can you maybe make that natively through our platform rather than having to use, you know, third party systems that you plug That'd in? That'd be good. Um, you know, subsequently from that, how can we make sure that we're then taking summaries of those calls and putting them back into the CRM system for you? That'd be decent. Um, and then there's a couple of other things that we're looking at around like the, you know, once you get that meeting with a client or candidate and you're having those meetings, how can we provide insight on what happens in those meetings to your leadership team to coach you? Um, and even down to things like, 
you know, if automating the follow-up has always been our key, what happens when you submit a CV to someone? How do you make sure that those follow-ups to get those interviews booked in are in place as well? Mm. And it's not just following up when you're trying to get the meeting, but actually following up when you're when you're in the process. So there are just a couple of things that are top of mind at the moment. Mm. There's obviously a ton more on the roadmap, but yeah, I'm really excited for it, man. Yeah, I do really like that idea of like your system for work. I think that's a good way to think about it. Totally. Um, yeah, get your point on the the phone bit because that makes sense because when you do it right now you have to use whatever phone product you're using right? yeah absolutely and that's the thing we'll never look to you know if you've got a third party phone system that you love yeah. and that you're then cool like we, we obviously have that integration where you can call through the platform and, and they work together but there are people who don't have that set up and mm. you know they're calling from their mobile etc that information is not recorded it's not logged yeah. into their system so rather than just saying a call was made we want to be able to say a call was made here's the recording of it and by the way here's a summary of what happened in that mm. conversation as well and push that into the push that into the system so what like to round round like look uh, round out looking ahead like from your perspective obviously you're in an interesting seat like what do you think you know great companies are going to be doubling down on going into next year when we think about this multi-channel approach because for me for a lot of conversations that i'm having with people it really is about how can we make sure our our team have the right skills and the right tools to yeah. really maximize uh, the market when there will be another uplift but let's learn from this year and make sure that you know when things do pick up when maybe people are saying more well, yes more, there's more maybe funding released in certain areas when it's just a bit more buoyant our team can really maximize that um, whilst also making sure that you know things do continue to be difficult or more difficult than they have been that they've got the right skills and, and tools yeah. so like what are you saying people really what do you think people should be doubling down on it's an interesting one, right? Like, I think if I was to look at it selfishly from a source wheel perspective, um, you know, obviously the platform, like from our side, we always, we're, we're consistently pushing the message of, it's great that you know that you're all in on BD at the moment, but how are you doing your candidate sourcing in the background? Mm. You know, can we make sure that source wheel's, you know, executing that for you as well? I think um, a big part of the move for 2024 internally will be people continuing to coach and upskill their team not just on their BD approach, but also in their pitching ability, making sure that we don't end up in this almost reverse bubble where the market flips back to candidate sourcing and people have forgotten how to engage candidates <laughs> properly, right? Like it's almost yeah, this, like, it's weird, this weird matrix. But I think the big one will actually be offline events. Um, I really? see, yeah, like I just think like off, offline connection, like in a market where everyone mm. is trying their best to engage with people and trying mm. to stand out, is there anything better than being able to actually meet someone face to face, whether that's at a live podcast mm. event or whether that's for dinner or for coffee or, you know, an exclusive round table event or whatever it might be. We've seen massive traction this year by, you know, meeting people offline and certainly from what we're hearing from the clients that we work with, like some of the more kind of I was gonna say successful ones, but certainly the ones who are reporting that they're, you know, not finding it as tough as the yeah. others is they've doubled down on making sure that their business development approach isn't just to simply get a meeting to win a job. Yeah. It's to, it's to you know, create an offline relationship. Um, mm. So I think that'll be really It's interesting to say that, right? Because it's like, it's almost like we go so far one way where, like, because I, I do agree with you, what we've really been trying to do this quarter is see as many of our clients face-to-face -face as possible. Yeah. Which has involved a two-hour drive out of London, these types of things. And it's almost like, it's so easy to not do that now. Yeah. And it's so easy to use ChatGPT to create my email outreach. Yep. That if I sort of overdo it on that, people see through that. And it's almost then like not doing too much of that or going the other way that people then really appreciate. Do you, oh. do you know what I mean? And like, that's the thing. Like, I think it's always going to be like, try and do what most people are not doing. It's almost the... Because <laughs> yeah. the, the, the I've seen like, posts on like, don't use like AI for this, don't use AI for that. And then, do you know what I mean? It's sort of most, we try and like really evolve things in a certain way. And then it's like, what will help you actually stand out is. We had a, we, we had a KPI at Audra, which was the number of like on-site client visits or on-site really? trainings. Yeah, yeah, so we used to KPI our team um, on, uh, it was a minimum of four a month. So you had to go out there, you had to meet with either a client face-to-face -face or, or a customer face-to-face. -face, and that's where a lot of the training we did. In fact, actually for a very long time up until the pandemic, even though we were a video technology company, we insisted on training people at their offices. Mm. I remember when we rolled out Austin Fraser when I was at Audra, mm. which was 
a couple of months after actually we did our 2019 podcast, um, I travelled to their London and Reading offices and then I did Munich, Berlin and Hamburg and then I did Austin, Dallas and wow. Denver to launch the product. And, you know, the engagement that we got on the back of that was, you know, much better than what it would have been if we just simply had, you know, all of those consultants. There was, I can't remember the exact number, it was over a hundred of them yeah. just on, on uh, online. Yeah, it's interesting that. It's, it's definitely, like, I can definitely echo, I think, yeah, a lot of recruitment companies have that or should have that as part of their strategy. How are they going to bring people in the industry together? What they're doing? Is it through podcasts? Is it through, you know, networking events? Is it through round tables, wherever it may be? Yeah. Uh, so that, that makes sense. Do you want to quickly enlighten us when we're thinking ahead? Yes. These are uh, what a lot of people have been posting about. These deliverability rules. Do yeah. you want to just give us some wisdom on that, mate? Absolutely. Um, so the the deliverability rules really apply to like Google and Yahoo workspaces. Um, essentially, um, it was a few weeks ago now they came out and said, look, from kind of February uh, twenty twenty four, if you are sending uh, more than five thousand emails and zero point three percent of those are marked or reported as spam, which I think is fifteen, mm. then there's going to be a massive clampdown on your domain, essentially. Um, what was really interesting about this at the time was that didn't just apply to like marketing emails that you were sending from like your CRM system with a massive mail shot or the emails that you were sending for BD, either from your own emails or through something like Sourcewheel, um, although Sourcewheel does use your emails, mm. um, or actually even like me and you right now organizing to meet up today, right? So mm. like all of those types of emails were all included in that, in that 5,000 number. So naturally that freaked people a little bit because mm. look, you can start to calculate how quick and easy it would be to go above that number in a slightly larger organization. And the part that was that was really tough on it was that it was applicable not just to personal, like at gmail.com, so candidates essentially, but also workspaces as well. Mm -hmm. Really hard to know who's on a Google workspace. But actually over the last couple of days, what's happened is Google have actually updated that guidance to say, we stand by what we were saying previously. However, it's applicable not now to Gmail workspaces, but oh. only to, to personal email addresses. However, you know, really keen to say that that could change again. Like, oh, actually, if you go onto their FAQs on it right now and you refresh it a couple of times, it goes from saying that it doesn't include work to it does include it does, work. Yeah. So, so I think they're probably, I think they released that so a significant amount of pressure, obviously, from, from their customers and then have maybe made some some changes. I don't know, but I think, like, ultimately, there are some things that you can do to avoid falling foul to that anyway, but mm. I think it's important to be aware of what those those changes are. Yeah, so I mean, regardless, it, like if it encourages people to think about the quality of what they're sending and how that's much it. and like how relevant it is, who it's for, I only think that's a net net positive. I, you're spot on and you were talking about like the changes that people are going to make in 2024. Yes, getting people offline is obviously important to build that relationship, but just making sure that you're breaking down your ICP segment mm. and not just saying, hey, we've got a tech candidate update, let's send it to any candidate that works in tech on our database, but actually saying, here's an update for developers versus CTOs mm. versus X, Y, and Z, and then being really specific with that approach. Um, you know, that's talking about it from a marketing, marketing perspective. And then, yeah, from a sales perspective, like, you know, reaching out to people one-on-one, -on -one, just take the extra time to personalize something. Like, I don't get people who just want to plug something in and then just blast it off and then think, oh, well, we might get five or six responses from it. Like, mm. it just, you could spend the same amount of time and get 10 if you just made an effort. Yeah, well, I think a lot of people have that's what they're like i literally spoke to a company today where they were like what was working last year isn't mm -hmm. working this year or they're having to put like twice as much in to get half as much back totally and it's just like yeah it's also worth thinking about can you you know f consider what you have been doing can you be doing that better <laughs> absolutely and i think it's <laughs> you know that I mean? quality and quantity matrix mm. like i don't believe that it's one or the other i believe that it can be both mm. um but it's just about having some way of monitoring, like what is the quality of the work that we're doing and how are we how are we monitoring who we're targeting, not just over email, but like over the phone and LinkedIn. Um, and then how are we making sure that we're doing enough of it ultimately when we mm. find something that works. So to round this out then, yeah. I'm extremely excited to be doing, like just cl just closely uh, working with you guys this year. Oh, sorry, sorry. Like really, really excited for it. Um, obviously we're gonna have, again, we're gonna do a number of live events this year. Yep. I've heard there's rumours there's going to be one in Scotland, maybe. Uh, yeah, we've, like, we're going <laughs> to have to, you, we're gonna have you to come make sure the everyone's happy with that. But yeah, we'll definitely do London and Manchester. Absolutely. Obviously, we, we uh, experimented with Bristol this year, yeah. which, which was fun. Maybe do a wild card. Um, definitely open to Scotland, you know. Yeah. I think that would be... We've we've learned, we've really enjoyed these away days. That's what yeah. we call them. <laughs> the as, away as days. A, as, a, as a team. <laughs> um, so, that. yeah, I think Scotland's another great 
little hub for recruitment companies. Definitely. Um, so yeah, really excited to work on more stuff like that. Obviously, we're going to be uh, you know championing Sourcewell um, every single week, um, which I'm excited about. I think for me. The position that, that uh, I'm in and, and the podcast and everything, I think it's just so important that, you know, when we are partnering with companies like yours, that, you know, there's an actual belief in what you guys actually do. Oh, <laughs> right? I think that's just so important. <laughs> so, like, I was really excited to try and do something with you guys just because I just think, you know, in terms of thinking about that workspace and yep. how you can help recruiters, I think if more and more recruiters get systems in place um, and view... Uh, you know, the way that they do their BD, the way that they do their headhunting candidate, um, the candidate stuff, in a way that you're trying to encourage them with your product. I just think people will have more and more um, success. Um, so, yeah, looking forward to highlighting certain things of the, the product this year. I think, do you want to just, like, would you mind just sharing, I guess, like, what are the, the t like, if I'm listening to this right now, yep. and I've got one or two of these problems, or I'm thinking about these one or two things, what what are those typically that then means that they should at least look to understand how Sourcewell might be able to help? Would you mind just educating us on that? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, there's my wife just calling me, so I'm just uh, no declining her call. <laughs> uh, <all right. laughs> um, yeah, so I think if you are sitting there right now and you believe that you need to be booking more meetings with potential clients or potential candidates, mm. then that's the first that's the first alarm bell. I think if you're sitting there saying I. And booking, um, you know, and, and obviously the way to do that is to be able to assess and analyze what you're currently doing, mm -hmm. right? I think if you're sitting there saying that's that's one thing, I need to book more meetings, whether it's clients or candidates. The second one is I feel like I'm spending so much time just adding stuff into the CRM system, or maybe I'm not adding anything into the CRM system and I'm constantly getting it tight from a manager mm -hmm. uh, on a Friday afternoon for, for what I'm doing. Um, and then I think the third one is like, if I feel like I'm using like multiple different systems when it comes to business development and headhunting, like, you know, uh, different ways of outreach and, and I'm managing it across multiple different places. And I just feel that, you know, coming in every day and spending an hour trying to think of who I'm going to reach out to, et cetera, is, is difficult. Then mm. I think any of those three things, like give me a shout and you don't have to run a recruitment business to come and have a conversation. Like I'm more than happy to chat to people mm. um, and, and talk to them a little bit more, not just about what Sourcewheel's doing, but some of the best practices that we're just seeing across the industry in general as well. Yeah, I love it. Well, I'm, I'm excited for the year ahead, excited for, you know, the work that we're going to do uh, with each other. So absolutely looking forward to it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it as well.